I didn't see the numbers that came behind. But there, there was um, a big push to do an educational expansion, but there's also been a huge shortage of teachers, uh, especially at the secondary level. So, but that, this is, these are primary school weavers, so I don't know. They might have been messing with the exam, too. Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, Fran Barris could answer that, um, but she's not here. She sent her regrets. Uh, I think she's teaching. So let me also just mention uh, briefly that, that like uh, most of, if not all of Sub-Saharan Africa, there has been really uh, a lot of environmental degradation in Tanzania. Um, there's the deforestation is happening at a, an extremely rapid rate. So in the last 20 years, um, the World Bank estimates that uh, a size, the, the size of uh, the state of South Carolina has been deforested in Tanzania, and this is continuing. And it's continuing because um, people use wood for everything. People use wood for cooking on a daily basis, if not directly with wood, then with charcoal, which has been made from wood. And they use wood for firing bricks, they use wood for building compounds for their livestock, they use wood for building. I mean, uh, wood is also sold, wood is um, stolen. There's a great, a, a lot of trade in stealing the most um, expensive woods and, and zipping them out of the country. Uh, so anyway, this is, this is all likely to continue. Um, the problem is, in addition to not having the wood in the future, that forests are really important in providing water catchment areas. That is, allowing the the systems to work that provide water for people on a regular basis. So water and firewood have been becoming um, harder to get in many years. People have to go farther to get the firewood, and some water that used to be there isn't there anymore. They're, they're not able to, to dig for it. It's drying up. So this is all, of course, happening in part because of the extremely rapid population growth rate. 3.1% may not look like a big number, but it implies that the population doubles in size about every 22 years. In 22 years, imagine the infrastructure that you would need in order to keep up if you had infrastructure. Jim? What were comparable rates in the U.S., or what's our rate? In the U.S., the doubling time for the population? Or the rate? The the rate, do we, you know the population growth rate, Raggy? It's less than 1%. Yeah, it's much less than 1%. Yeah. I mean, anything <coughs> that you see that's above 2% is high enough to really worry about. So. Isn't it right that it's really principally so, uh, principally so here in Africa where these very high rates of population increases are yeah. now? Because most other areas have gone down dramatically. And, and rates are much higher in rural areas than in urban areas. So Marjorie would have known the rate of population growth. Uh, okay. So, um, anyway, it, so rural population growth rates are much higher than, um, than urban rates, but a very high percentage of the Tanzanian population is still rural, so that doesn't help us as much as we would like. Um, all right, so, so what I'm trying to do is set the stage for a situation where um, there's pressure put on families to get water and firewood, um, especially in the dry season. Water can, be, uh, can really take a long time to get. I have been told by Tanzanian colleagues that you need you know, a, 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 re a pretty a re reasonable size household might use you know, 20 big buckets of water a day to do all their cleaning and washing in an urban area. In a rural area, people, I'm sure, are getting by with a lot less than that. And, um, but this is just one example of uh, wood that's been cut down and is clearly going to be used to, f to make bricks, to fire bricks. So I have a lot of pictures that I'll show you as we go through here. Um, but. But I wanted to talk for a minute about, about the theory, about what these connections are that ideally we would like to make. 
right? Ideally, we would like to be able to track environmental degradation over time, um, following the same people to see how in the same communities uh, it, it maybe takes longer and longer to get water on a daily basis. It might take longer to go to find firewood and to gather it and to uh, also track the time that kids spend in school and studying for school and, uh, and look at their, their outcomes and to draw some kind of causal implication. Right? It, it would be, that's the, that's the um, big picture theory that I'm trying to put forward, that, that there's some connection there. Um, and so as a first step, Deb DeGraff and I got a fairly small amount of money to do a pilot study. And our goal was to figure out, well, what, what can we measure and how can we measure these, these particular things? We don't have enough money to do uh, more than a cross-sectional pilot study. But that should help us to understand how better to, to get a handle of these these things in the future. So that's what we did and, and the background for this also is that at the time I was working with the whole village project which was a collaboration between the University of Minnesota and, um, Tanz and Savannah's Forever Tanzania and so the whole village project was doing a lot of surveys of villages um, and you can see from this map that these, all these red dots are villages that were uh, in the Whole Village Project survey. And at the time, Madri, who just came in, was the leader for the survey research team, and that's how I got to know her. Um, so I'm not showing you the villages that we uh, did our pilot study of because they have to remain anonymous. They're under the label. So, but... Um, <laughs> but, but they're there, um, and, and I was living here in Arusha, and so there were, uh, so what, what we did is um, we decided to, to use the data that already existed, and, um, the, and the fact that the samples of households in the village had been um, done randomly, so we had a random selection of households, and we looked at the whole village project data, and we said, well, okay, we need, we'd need, we like to look at villages where there's some variation, where we see differences in, in how much time it's taking for people to get water and firewood, and we, there was a little bit of information on that that we were able to use. And we also needed to be within a day's drive of Arusha, because we didn't have enough money to pay for a lot of petrol. And uh, so there were some other considerations like that. So. But the, the, the villages were not um, chosen for any other uh, particular reasons than that. So we, uh, the, these two villages that we ended up with uh, were both in a semi-arid region uh, where, as in most parts of rural Tanzania, people were either engaged in agriculture or in herding or both. Uh, these two villages were dominated by one tribe, although there are uh, many, many tribes in Tanzania. And in terms of religion, most people were Muslim. And this, sorry, this picture is from an initial meeting we had with village leaders um, before the, the study was approved. So they had to approve what we were doing. Here's a picture of the kind of field that you might see in that area. And um, you can see that it's not been done using tractors. Um, people have hoes. Um, there's, there isn't a, a lot of technology. And it's, uh, the, the people who have to carry water are really lucky if they have a bicycle, as we see in this picture, which also shows some uh, brick kilns in the background. So here's how, here's the technology for carrying water. You either have it on your head, or if you're lucky, you have a bicycle and you can carry two big buckets at one time. Um, and so even this kind of donkey pull cart is out of reach of most, most households in these villages. Here's another map. So 
again, this is where we were starting from. This is the Dodoma region, and we were working within Kondoa district there. It was the dry season because we wanted to um, we wanted to see how long people were taking to get water in the in, under the um, not the absolute worst conditions, but relatively bad compared to the rainy season. This was not it was sort of the middle of the dry season, and things always get worse towards the end of the dry season. So you can see our study is small, 57 households, 114 youth. Um, we, what we did is, again, using Use the Whole Village Project Households for our frame, we, what we, went, we looked at the data and we said, all right, we're going to go back to every household that has a, a youth in the age range of our interest, and, so, and that was 10 to 17-year-olds. We did surveys of, yes, Karen? Why did you bound it? Why did you put the lower bound at 10 years old? Um, well, there are a few reasons. One of them has to do with the IRB. Okay. So in order, it, it, it took me three or four months to get this whole project through IRB at the University of Minnesota and Tanzania. And the younger children you work with, the harder it is to get IRB approval. Um, the, the second reason is that when you look at data of work that kids do around the world, that in terms of um, labor force work, most kids do relatively little before about the age of 10. They're, they are doing chores, um, but in terms of, so of where child work really starts to increase, it is about age 10. So that's why. Can I cite that in my next discussion with my daughter? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it, I think it's just that kids become much more capable. I mean, they, you know, as they grow, they get more capable at about about those ages. Depending on the child, they become able to do different things. And um, so, what we what we try to do is. Uh, have each uh, enumerator take the, the young person aside, sort of in sight of their family, under a tree, but where they could speak um, in privacy. We didn't know if it made any difference, but we wanted to, to do that. Um, sometimes, if it, because we also wanted to ask the mothers the same questions that we were asking the kids. We wanted, because when you ask young people about time use, you know, you're, you're never really sure. Adults are always going to say, well, you know, the kids don't remember very well, they don't have a very good concept of time, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's there tip, many times when people do surveys asking about kids' time use, they don't even ask the kids. But we wanted to ask the kids about uh, their time use and their, and their experiences. And we didn't want them to be contradicted by the adults in their families or, or punished for saying the wrong thing. And we also wanted to ask the, their mothers or female guardians uh, similar questions and see how, how the answers were similar or dissimilar. So what, this, did you, what did you do when the parents didn't want you to speak to the kids on their own? We didn't get any refusals. And, and it's not like we were taking that they were out of sight, right? They were they were clearly safe. They were visible. Um, people are really polite in Tanzania, and you know, even when they're busy, we're extremely helpful. So we didn't have that problem. A little sideline for the study is that we were interested in differences between uh, mothers and kids' responses. We wondered if there were systematic patterns that we would find, and that's not the purpose of my talk today. And um, I don't want to lose track of time either. We go until... Yeah, that clock is stopped. Because <laughs> it's great. Okay. It's, it's nine minutes after one. Okay. Um, thank you, Anna. That would be really helpful. Yes. Okay, so now I have the time. We should take that clock down. <laughs> it's very confusing. 
Okay, so we have this survey of mothers and gu or, or guardians, and I'm, I'm just going to call them women, but that's who they are. And we have fewer of them than, than kids, because we have some kids from the same household. We also did focus groups, and we split them up so that girls and boys were separate, and we had younger and older children separate, too. Uh, we thought little kids might not speak up in groups with much older kids, and, and so forth. We also uh, went to schools to get administrative data, and uh, actually, this was the weakest point of our study. We did not succeed in getting data from uh, half of the schools because it had been lost in a move. But we had expected to be able to get students' class rank and scores on recent tests. And typically, and we were able to get that, but only for a fraction of our sample. So that was, this, these are the sorts of things you learn by doing a pilot study. Always go to the schools first, and then if they don't have the data, move on. Okay. Uh, so, but we didn't do that. And, and here you can see we, we bought some straw mats and focus groups were held under trees. Uh, this is a girls' focus group in one village, and then here's another one under a really nice tree. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. So what? So I'm not going to focus today on the children's versus the women's responses, but I will tell you which responses, which data I'm showing you, um, and then and then my focus will be on environmental chores. But there, there's other stuff too. So one issue that comes up when you're trying to ask people about firewood is how do you collect data on firewood? And and luckily we had been wrestling with this in the whole village project, and we had arrived at a solution which was get one head load, this, this one in particular, and take the picture around and show it to people. So this was our standard unit, you might say, right? <laughs> so we, we, had, we would take it around and we'd, we'd say, okay, I'd like to show you a photograph of a woman carrying a bundle of wood. And then we'd say, are the bundles of wood that you gather about this size or bigger or smaller? Just so people would really focus on the bundle. And then we'd say, well, okay, well, how many bundles of this size did you gather in the past week? And we were, you know, when we first started uh, uh, testing this in the whole village project, we were worried that it wouldn't work. But actually, people are so used to gathering wood that they can make this translation in their head. And they can estimate how many bundles of this size they were able to, um, to gather. So that's, that was the metric that we used for wood. And then, in terms of uh, water, we it was um, we actually mainly focused on time, but we also did co try to collect amount by having people look at the buckets or um, or containers that people have been using to to get the water and bring it back in, so that we could get a sort of a, a volume measure at the same time. I'm not going to use any of that today. I'm just going to focus on time. This is a this is the case of a water tap um, and kids collecting water. And there were some water taps and they looked they looked like this, for example. But we also did find that one village didn't have any taps at all. And in the dry season, this is where they were getting water. They were going to the nearby river and they were digging holes and waiting for the water to seep in, and then they were scooping it out. Um, this is called surface water. Even when you're way below the surface of the river, because it's the water that seeps to the surface. So uh, you can see that in the dry season, get, collecting water can, be, uh, can really take a lot of effort and time. So what, what I want to show you next are some statistics related to time spent and um, on, on gathering water and wood. So let's see. So these are average numbers of minutes on these particular chores in the last week. So we have 319 minutes on average fetching water and 78% of the kids fetched water in the past week. So uh, that was, a, you know, over five hours, right? And then uh, gathering wood, 391 minutes, so over six hours. 
and uh, and this is combined for those so for those kids who did both um, on average what was the total uh, 516 minutes and then we have percentages so 38 percent of the kids actually just did one chore and uh, 39 did both uh, there I'm a bit confused how Sorry. can 78 percent be gathering water and only 38%. Yeah, it was Deb who made this table, and I always have to think three times about it. Let's see. I can't remember, Raggy. I remember that tripped me up last time, and I meant to meant to look it up again. I figured it out once. Anyway, let's ignore those. <laughs> um, so there are some differences with respect to uh, not so much in total time for boys and girls but in terms of the percentages who were engaged in those activities so many uh, when we have about 84 percent of girls fetching water and only about two-thirds of boys about 48 percent of girls gathering wood and about 30 percent of boys when you look at it by younger versus older age groups, it's, it's younger kids who are much more involved in these kinds of chores. So as kids get older, they seem to move into um, different sorts of activities, particularly, of course, farming and herding. Uh, so let me go on. So, so Margaret, what did I chip in? Uh, we're getting, I mean, uh, we're getting Brady's question. So when these questions like uh, multiple answer whereby they don't add up to a hundred, multiple responses, like someone just say, just report, can report fetching water or can just report gather wood. Yeah, but it seems like this one should be at least 39.5%. That's my problem with this. Okay. It's, it's not a great uh, way of presenting this. We have to figure out something better, whatever it was meant to do. So let's... Uh, Maybe it's only one. Oh, that's what it is. Thank you. Yes, that's what it is. This is, this is only, only one. So if you add them both together, you get... Yes. Yeah, because some some kids um, aren't engaged in. Yes. Go ahead. No, I was just trying to help you get myself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, you get the, the general idea. Okay. Uh, so so let's go on. So this is thinking about well, what about percentages in school? So we would think that we would look for evidence of conflict between school and environmental chores if. You know, the more time you spent on chores or the more you participated in chores, the less likely you were to be spending time in school. Well, uh, we didn't find it. We found pretty much the opposite in general. And you can uh, see that here that, uh, let's see. So this is, this is the percentage of kids who are in school um, overall, so so of those who are fetching water, 80.9% are in school, right? Of those who aren't fetching water, 68% are in school. Not, and this is just, are you, go, are you in school or not? So um, similar patterns for wood, and Good. then... Isn't it because those who are not fetching water are doing or those who are not in school are doing labor market work. Labor but you're jumping work. ahead of me, but yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, it, it also may be that there's some kind of social contracts that, you know, if you want to go to school, you have to be a good kid and do, do the chores that we need you to do. You know, do these, in particular, these kinds of environmental chores. And if you're not going to be a good kid and do them, then we're going to put you to farming all day or herding all day. So, but we, we don't have any evidence of that, um, just suggestion that that might be the situation. And, and this one case in blue is the only case where um, we, we don't see that pattern and the difference is, is small enough so it's not statistically significant even. So, 
all right, we, didn't, we don't see that initially. So then what we did is a bunch of threshold analyses that I'm not going to show you, but we said, okay, well, maybe, maybe it's once you get to a certain number of hours doing something that that affects your school attendance. Um, so we, we started with low thresholds and we kept going up and up and we said, okay, so we'll compare those doing like uh, more than seven hours to those doing less than seven hours and those doing more than eight hours to those less than eight hours. So just looking at a, a dichotomy to see if at some point it looks like there's a big threshold effect. Jim? Is there a technique for estimating thresholds or do you just have to guess and, do dichot and run them with different dichotomies? We just brute forced this one. There might be, there might be. Rogan could probably program it, but uh, no, I think I think this one was pretty much brute forced. Uh, and and actually, we we don't um, typically. We saw that the if you had a lot of minutes spent doing a particular chore, then that group had a higher um, enrollment or participation in the school. So there were a few exceptions that are noted here but not enough to get really excited about. So, didn't see what we thought was obvious. And it seemed so obvious that the people who were reviewing our little grant proposal at the university said, don't we know this already? <laughs> Are you sure? But actually, oddly enough, there's almost nothing written about this particular issue, uh, which is, of course, one reason why we decided to do the study, because we. We looked and looked and couldn't find literature out there and, and thought, well, maybe everybody assumes it is completely obvious, but it seems like somebody should check. All right, so in Tanzania, in this particular area, it is not obvious. But then, you know, really we're not so much interested in um, enrollment as in learning at school because there's pretty high enrollment, relatively speaking, in primary school at least. Uh, what we'd like to do is look at outcomes, like test scores and class rank, all the stuff that we didn't succeed in getting uh, because of that glitch in our, in our data collection. But we did get, we do have other information. We did all those pilot, all those focus groups. So uh, we do have we do have some quotes for, uh, you know, so there are girls who said, well, there are a lot of domestic chores. No, normally I get tired and I don't have time to study. A lot of work reduces the desire to study. As a result, you forget what was taught the previous day. When I get to school, I only sleep because I'm tired. Things like this that are suggestive. Um, so we had other things that we could use besides uh, test scores and class rank. We did have some information about days absent in the past uh, seven days and hours per day spent on homework in the past seven days. So we looked at those by categories and um, what, what we see is that absence from school is generally more common for those who are doing these environmental chores at home. And you can see that um, here, among those fetching water, there's there's a higher percentage of them who are missing more days from school, and that's also that's actually there for the last category. That's not holding true for firewood, but uh, it is for the middle category. Um, girls, eh, well, so so it's what we're doing is we're seeing. Uh, fewer people with fewer kids with no days absent if they're engaged in these environmental <coughs> chores. So that's that's one clue that there's some conflict between doing these chores and being in school. Now, it's not clear that being in school every day matters very much if there's very little learning going on in school, right? If there's very little that happens in school. <laughs> then if you miss a day or two a week, maybe it doesn't matter very much in terms of how much you learn. Um, when we can't, we don't have the data to argue that point here. Um, we do also see in, in terms of homework, um, 
so this is the among those doing two or more hours of homework a day. And this is these um, this is based on by the way, these two things are based on the women's information. The um, chore participation, so doing the chores, that's based on the kid information, but we were missing too much information about this stuff to use the kids' information, so we used the women's information. So, for what it's, and, and so they're, who knows how closely they're supervising their kids or keeping track of these hours. Um, but it does seem that um, that there's a conflict there to some extent. So let me go on. There's another thing that that might easily have messed up our data to some extent. It turns out that children also do a lot of in these environmental chores for their schools and their teachers. This is not one of my pictures, it's from the internet, but, um, but kids tell, uh, told us, we asked about this because we, we, had, we knew that it, it, was, it happened in some parts of the world, so we asked specifically and they said, oh yes, in the focus groups, we, we bring water and firewood, we're punished if we don't do that. Actually, some kids don't come because they, you know, if you don't, if you don't bring the things you're supposed to bring, then you can be caned. So, um, so we asked about this, and the problem is that we can't tell whether they're going out for water during school hours to fetch it, or if this is part of the time that they spent at home fetching water, and then they just take some of that to school. And we didn't have a good way of sorting that out, so that's another thing that one learns from a pilot study. Uh, but 91% of these of the kids who were in school did report sometimes fetching water, and 81% did that in the last week. Um, about two-thirds of those said that they got the water during school hours, and then the rest of them were bringing water from home. Uh, they did about almost four trips to get water a week, and they typically spent um, more than four hours on this, getting, on getting water only for the school. So just to clarify, sure. so the um, overall number of minutes they spent every week gathering water, that doesn't differentiate between whether that was um, during school hours or not during school hours? That was, that was not during school hours. Okay. That was specifically water gathered not during school hours. Um, but that's the problem that some of them then brought some of that water to school, and then others had went out during school hours to get water. So um, there would probably be a good way of... I mean, one would have to think about how to differentiate better between that. We were worried when we set out to do this about confounding factors, and um, in particular, we thought, all right, there are other reasons that kids don't want to go to school. And if we don't control for them, and we just assume kids are out of school because they're doing environmental chores, we're going to, uh, we're going to probably do something wrong here. So um, we we know that in a lot of places there is a fair amount of violence at school. There is bullying. We, kids are beaten, etc. Um, and we know that there are a lot of teachers who have very little training and. Teacher absence is extremely common in uh, many low-income countries. So kids show up and then there's no teacher. So that may be less true when the teachers live at the school, as is the case in many Tanzanian villages, but I don't know. I don't have data on that. I, I do believe there's a fair amount of evidence. Also, the other thing is that conditions regarding uh, the infrastructure variables uh, change. And these things are out of the control of kids and families to some extent. So water holes may dry up, um, but if there's piped water, if there's a, like if there's a, a well and a tap, um, then you just never know if it's working. Things are broken a, a large percent of the time in sub-Saharan African water systems. There's evidence about that. So if you're collecting this kind of data, you kind of need to know whether the tap is working 
that week. Or, and also, from what some of these kids said, sometimes there's a well, there's a tap, but it's turned off. So it's not, it's not turned on at the time when the kids need to get the water and go to school. And, and Jimmy had a question. And then the, the, last, um, the last thing has to do with, with their, their fears <clears throat> and also uh, what they might, they might prefer to play. Right, then to go to school and maybe maybe going to fetch firewood co is connected with playing and, and it's been fun to do that in other places. So let me cruise through some things here. Um, with respect to punishment, we asked about punishment. We knew that this was a topic that people commonly discussed and, and um, that parents in particular are in favor of kids being punished at school in general. So. Uh, and nobody seems bothered about discussing this. So we, we have a, a number of quotes from um, kids about punishment. We found that 38% of youth in our study had been disciplined in the past week. There were 44 separate episodes that we noted. Girls were more likely to be disciplined than boys. That surprised me. In the US, it's, it's more often the boys that are making trouble in the classroom. Um, and kids were... Um, were, their hands were caned, they were caned on their rear ends, um, they were punished by being made to fetch water, um, their ears were, were curled or boxed. Uh, these are not insubstantial numbers given that we had a pretty small sample here. And, and students really didn't like this, of course, as you might expect. Uh, they, also know, they also had a lot of comments about teachers. The, the students said, well, teachers should teach well. Proper supervision of teachers is needed to make sure they teach. So even if you have a teacher who's there, doesn't mean they're actually teaching. Um, they should ask teachers to attend class. These seem like basics that, that we may assume that, that these things are already happening in schools, but we're, they are not happening. So there are reasons why kids might not want to go to school. Yeah. Did you have any data about how often the teachers were paid or how they were paid? No, we didn't. We didn't do a teacher survey at all. Yeah. Um, good question. Yeah, it's definitely related to teachers not feeling like they are really not wanting to teach if they're not paid. They're not paid very much. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, infrastructure. And, uh, and we didn't have information on how to find out whether water was running or not, and who was responsible for these, these wells. We didn't have the time to um, do an investigation about that, but wells may be installed by the local government or the district or the national government, or they might be installed by um, non-governmental organizations. That's much more common. So, and then they might, it's, then it may be unclear who's meant to maintain them after that. That's fairly. Typical. So that would be something that would have to be investigated. I'm sorry, Deborah, did you say that the, the majority of were, were installed by non profit organizations? Um, no, I, I actually don't have data on that. But that's my impression for rural villages in Tanzania. Carrie, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I mean, my sense was that they're mostly um, built by the government, but then often they will fall into disrepair, and then sometimes they get taken up and maintained by an NGO, but they often also get maintained by sort of local for-profits that will charge for water. And clearly some of these people were being charged, Madri. Just adding on that, for example, like uh, in my village, they put, uh, there were some water types that were installed like in the early 90s that were uh, by the government, but but through the Danida project, the Danish. Mm -hmm. So okay. some of them, a few of them are still working. Uh, a lot of them are not. So I mean, it's the government that is supposed to follow up, like I mean, making sure that the jobs are working or at least preparing them. But in a lot of cases, they don't follow up. So in this case, it's a big foreign donor that's paying for wells that are installed by the, what, the district government? Do you, yeah. You know, district yeah, the district government. Support, yeah. 
and then which in theory should be maintaining them but is not and so they fall into disrepair. Yeah, thank you. The other thing is that the kids were actually, uh, some kids had a lot of fears about going out to collect firewood or to get water. Um, and we had a, really a surprising number of quotes like the first one, we go with another person because there are people who rape and chop off parts of people's bodies. This was a girl 13 to seven, in the 13 to 17 year old focus group. A number of quotes like this, that kids were obviously being scared, may, who knows, maybe threatened by adults if you don't behave, you know, the boogeyman will get you. But Clearly a, a lot of fears. And then people, some kids talked about wildlife. One can meet dangerous wildlife that comes to drink water. Yeah, I mean, there's Tanzania. There are, and these are people living near um, game reserves. And yes, there are some wild animals around, but really there's, there's actually pretty little predation. We got some evidence about that. But more fear than, than, um, than actual risk. And then we also did hear some stories about kids playing. So um, boys told us, oh, we feel so happy as we tell stories and have some adventures too. Or when boys are sent to get fire with them, they collect nuts and they run around and they play. We didn't hear this from the girls. Um, no, I, there may well be social aspects to uh, girls doing chores together, but they didn't, they didn't report them. So. It's, if there are, they're probably less. So again, there, there are all these things that can confound a study if you really try to make what seems to be a very, very simple connection between time, the time spent um, on these environmental chores and educational outcomes. And so if it's, if it's that complicated to make the study in the, the connection and the cross-section, even with panel data, it may not be very straightforward. So um, that's really what we learned, that maybe there are no studies out there because it's too hard, <laughs> that it's, it's challenging to um, get all the different elements of the data correctly and expensive. Um, that, that there are all of these confounding factors and that there are probably different social norms in different areas and that um, certainly there may be there may be a social contract you, you, you know as I mentioned before as Raggi implied you if you're going if you want to stay in school you have to you have to do your chores you have to get the water and the firewood that the family needs and if you don't well you know impl implied threat perhaps who knows um, but certainly, older kids who are more likely to be engaged in labor force work were much less likely to be doing these chores, and they certainly spend less time on it. Jim, did you have a question or comment? I wondered if, you, if your team had thought about uh, any ethno ethnographic work. It seems to me that some of these questions could be resolved just by following children around for a couple weeks. Um, you, 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 for example, do girls play as much as boys? You know, observation would help with that. Um, I wonder whether you consider bringing in an ethnographer to your team. Well, we we don't have a team at the moment. Um, it it is something that I have thought about, definitely. Um, but it's certainly also very expensive. Yeah. Well, what is next step? I mean, this is still very tantalizing, and the, the really important question is how. I don't quite how to ask the question because I don't know what the, the trade-off between you know we're diminishing returns setting, but clearly they don't set in yet. I mean, that this looks like an important issue that demands more resources. What do you think about that? Well, I, th I think we're working on writing an essay right now to lay out the issues and to say, well, we we think there's there there probably is a connection there, and we think that it's understudied, and people are really worried about human capital in low-income countries and are not thinking about this really important other use of children's time and how it connects to that. But look, here are all these other issues you have to think about at the same time. So I don't have a good answer, Bob. Would you like to make an argument for why um, one should not look at the ratio of time 
But the rest of, of the volume of work collected or what I carry uh, to the amount of time, as opposed to looking at time. Uh, where, where this rest show is uh, kind of like a productivity measure. And what I'm interested in is I'm interested in um, you know, performance in school. You know, what the people who are more efficient in collecting the water also be the ones who are likely to do better in school. And the ones that, you know, take a real, real long time collecting the water, um, take a real long time getting work done. So, so there's kind of artificial relationship here between time in school and time collecting water if the real factor is some sort of ability factor or productivity factor. So could you make an argument against that? No, I think it's a great, would be a good measure. We uh, didn't feel confident in the, in the volume of water measures that we have collected. I think we will be looking at them again, but it was def definitely a harder uh, thing for the enumerators to do. And, and so you could, one bucket is pretty easy, but then there are a variety of other um, jugs that people use to collect so, water. So the clue, um, the thing that kind of prompted that question was that the gender differences. Uh, even though a larger fraction of the boys has to carry, uh, carry wood than the girls, it looked like the number of minutes that the boys were carrying uh, the wood was lower than the number of minutes that the girls were carrying wood. So does that suggest perhaps that the boys are stronger and that they end up carrying uh, more work for a given amount of time? And so that's really a productivity measure, I think. So, so the, the, the wood measure is how much time does it take you to go there, gather the wood, and come back? So there's also that issue of the gathering of the wood. And it, it also may be that boys are more involved in chopping down wood and girls are walking back and forth with it. So we, they're not directly comparable. Right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging. I mean, also with the water, it, this, I mean, the, the time does include gathering the water, but, um, but typically they're not digging a new hole. There's one there that they're going back to. And then I'll go around after that. I just have a measurement also question. It was just something that made me wonder about how children and their perceptions of time. And so, how when you had them talk about minutes or anything like that, that you, you what, what kind of corroborating or other confidence measures did you have that they were actually telling you? Time. Right. So we compared to the reports by the women, and the there were there were there were, so there was actually a fairly big group where there wasn't much of a difference, but then there were a number of there was also a substantial percentage where the children's minutes were higher than the women's minutes, and some of them way higher. Uh, so that made us worried. Uh, but we, we haven't done that analysis by age yet, and it, it may converge over time. You, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's hard to say who's actually going to make, be more accurate in some ways, because the woman knows how long the child was gone. But if we're talking about kids who are maybe also playing along the way, I, you know, it's hard to know whether the kids' calculations are including the play or not. Do, are they subtracting that out? So it, it's, it, it's challenging. It's maybe one reason why people don't normally ask both kids and, and adults. Uh, because they don't sing very well. Mm -hmm. Annika had, was had, and then, no, sorry, Carrie and Raghi after that. Um. I have this really interesting study, and um, I hope that you get funding to continue to do more on it. Um, I also was really interested in Jim's comment. I think about sort of the value. I think you would probably learn a lot, even if you um, hired an ethnographer just for a short amount of time, to try to figure out sort of how to tweak the questions that you're asking and like, the data that you're gathering in a more systematic way. Um, and I guess to that end, I had 
sort of two different comments about measurement and then sort of a conceptual question. Um, so the, the measurement questions, um, I think I had the same question about just, I think it's interesting to know um, time, but I, I also think it's difficult, and I would argue not just for the difference between kids and adults, but just the concept of measuring time um, in a, a society where, especially in rural areas, you know, not everyone has clocks and watches, um, and sort of, I personally have a horrible sense of time, and I live in a society that has a lot of clocks and watches around me at all times, so I should be able to accurately um, reflect on how much time it takes me to do something, but I don't always. But I think especially there where things aren't necessarily done at particular times of the day, that that could be tricky, just using a time measurement. So I guess I would encourage you in the future, if you're thinking about it, to, to add measures of both quantity, you know, so, um, in the same way that you had that great picture of the, the woman with the bundle of firewood, that you could have a few different kinds of vessels that people traditionally, you know, like mm -hmm. the, mafu, the um, oil containers that mm -hmm. the smaller kids use, or, you know, the traditional buckets. Um, I think, well, yeah, and we will be looking at that, more of that but yeah. Um, but just using mm -hmm. perhaps <clears throat> that, and then also some measure of distance, you know, that, that there's, um, at least my sense is that there's a limited number of locations, at least for water, that people will go to. So if, you, if you're if you working in just a few villages, you can get a sense of where it is that they're going for um, their water, and then be able to compute something about the distance that they have to travel for that. Um, and then just throwing out there, again, these are things that I'm sure if you did more ethnographic research, you'd like add to your, your list of measures. But in terms of conditions, um, like whether there's a line at wherever it is that they're going to collect water, especially, um, whether they have to pay for the water. Mm -hmm. Because that. often there's a trade-off, right, where there's you can go farther and not have to pay, or you can go someplace that's closer and have to pay. Um, and then what tools they have, because often, my sense at least, is that the girls will carry their water on themselves, on their heads, um, but often boys have access to carts of some sort, and so that might be an interesting gender dimension that you could find. Um, and then also, if you can get it past IRB, I would encourage you to think about the six to nine year old range because a lot of your pictures were of kids in that range. And my sense is that a lot of water carrying does get done by kids in that age range. So I'd be curious just to see how the data play out, especially since you found that the younger group within those that you studied did do more of those kinds of chores. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess the conceptual question that I've been wrestling with a little bit is just, um, Sort of the framing of this as an environmental issue, I'm getting sort of confused a little bit in terms of the causal chain of that. Because it seems to me like when I think about firewood, I think of the necessity to get firewood is an economic condition for most families, right? I, my sense, at least, is that um, families that have more means will buy charcoal, and families with less means will have to go and fetch firewood. And that has environmental implications but isn't caused by an environmental condition, whereas water, the sort of scarcity of water is caused by both sort of a scarcity of water environmentally, but then obviously compounded by the economic situation of not having sufficient water infrastructure. So I just... Wait, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Okay. So what, what's the difference? Because there, there's also scarcity of, of wood. Right, but the, the necessity to get... So almost, in these villages, almost nobody is buying charcoal. Mm -hmm. Like 97% of households are using, are using firewood. firewood. Right, so I guess I see these, though, as having... The gathering... I mean, this is also the sort of... Maybe I'm just not following the, the train of thought here, but calling these environmental chores is hard for me, and I keep trying to wrap my head around it. So I'd love to hear you tease that apart for me a little bit more, because... I see gathering firewood as having environmental implications, and gathering water is caused by an environmental situation. I see. Right, so the, where those fall on that spectrum is different for me, and I'm just having a hard time thinking of them as environmental chores other than. So I guess we're, we've always been more focused on the human capital end. Mm -hmm. And so we've come at this thinking about uh, how does scarcity in uh, in these, in these things that that they're taking, in these resources that are coming from the environment, how does that scarcity affect their human capital? So it's not, um, 
we aren't thinking about what what they're causing, mm -hmm. which they are. The environment, the environment we're not thinking about the environment. Really. Right. We're not thinking about the environmental damage they may be causing or what they're taking, but we're thinking about well. Um, so, given that they're 24 hours in a day, and given that, that we'd like kids to be in school if possible, with teachers there, um, to what extent does increasing scarcity of these, or might increasing scarcity of these resources affect that? Okay. So, we're, we're, not, we're not sort of completing the circle in terms of reality. Okay. So you need to do like a time study of the increasing scarcity of these and how it impacts yeah. if the children are in school. Absolutely. That would be the best way. And in terms of um, distance to water, you know, we, we thought about that and we actually got some GPS points, but the way that kids, especially girls, go to get water, you know, it's not a straight line. And I mean, people it's not just that they're going around fields and around houses, but they're avoiding places where there are young men who harass them. Um, and, you know, boys are avoiding places where other kids bully them. So there are, kids may not, kids do not take the shortest route often to get these to these places. And so, if, therefore, we felt like, um, and we tried to get at this in the focus groups, but kids weren't good enough visually with maps to actually tell us, you know, here's the route that we take. So we, we, we didn't succeed there either. We tried though, that's what you do in a pilot, right? Yep. You try. Raggy has been waiting. Well, no, I, I'm thinking, <laughs> since this is a pilot and we're thinking about how to design the, uh, the bigger study, um, I mean, you must have measured other time uses like labor force work. We did not. Okay. That was, so we, that was that another one. place where we really, you know, we really should have done that. We, because that could be yeah. there where the trade-off is. Right? Absolutely. Uh, we should have measured labor force work and we should have measured other chores and we just didn't have the budget. Right, what, what was Ruggie suggesting? I He's saying we should have measured labor force work. And, other time and we should uses. Have, besides we should have measured school, other time uses. Because there are surfaces, yeah. there are trade-offs that simply aren't in the picture. We yeah. absolutely should have done that. And, and that's, that's, that's something that we regret. But again, there's no way we could have yeah. afforded yeah. Oh. it. Okay, so the, the, the second issue, it seems to me that longitudinal data would help a lot. Uh, in terms of looking at, you know, because there's wet season and there's dry season. If you have yeah. measurements in both the wet and the dry season, you have you can get a, a certain exogenous variation in the amount of time it takes to get to water, for example, uh, uh, yeah, at the level true. of the individual child. Mm -hmm. That's true. <clears throat> there's also, it seems to me, it makes sense to measure all of these measures of work time, whether it's time, distance, or volume, <coughs> relative to other kids in your village versus village to village differences. Because village to village differences would indicate environmental differences. Whereas relative to other kids in your village, to the average mm -hmm. time it takes for kids in your village is maybe you do more or less relative to other kids. So I think you get two different things out of that. Uh, one is kind of the environmental effect of how far water is. Uh, so I think I would do a village effect in some sense, or try to neutralize village effect and look at it separately. It's a good idea, thank you. Um, but, you know, so I, I think that you can definitely, uh, I would try to get volume measures, but those are going to be in one village the amount of volume you can get in a given amount of time could be very different from another village. And so volume measures should be looked at relative to kids in your village rather than not. But I, I think there's, some, there's definitely a lot more you can do with that, and I would encourage you to think about this panel data set. Anyone knows a funder. Right, big Jim. panel. <laughs> yeah, Jim. Um, so in your field, what would a a regression table look like of uh, children's outcomes. What what normally do people control for? 
other researchers like yourself, how would you, would it be parental income, would it be, you know, what are the, the kind of standard laundry list of variables? Well, in this case, um, it's a not very monetized economy, so it would be some measure of wealth, probably, and yes, parents, education, and maybe number of kids, if you weren't too worried about that being endogenous, might be. Um, yeah, so you, you try to control for a whole variety of exogenous um, factors if you could get them. Like, do you have a bicycle to carry water? It would be good. The, the problem with this is that the causality is really difficult in this case. I mean, we, we played around with doing some regressions, but they're just so hard to believe because of the this, this statistical issues of endogeneity. Um, I mean, ev all of these things. Everything's endogenous. Everything's endogenous. People are, if you think about what's going on, households may be, or, or at least mothers and kids may be deciding about a whole lot of things simultaneously. So therefore, you can't put, you know, one thing on, you know, on one side of the regression and, and some of those other things. On the other side, it just doesn't work. Yeah, but you could do things like sibling the household fix effects, looking at sibling yeah. differences. Um, if you had more, if you had yeah. more data, no. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, if you had more data, you could you could figure out some tricky things to do. Um, I mean, we have we just have too little data to do very much at all of that sort, and, and certainly nothing to do um, anything that would deal with the endogeneity. Time maybe for one more question, uh, Magic. So uh, I was wondering. Like with the with the bundle file we used, like uh, for you maybe to determine whether people understood or interpreted the picture in the same way or the amount in the same way. Uh, do you maybe try to relate to the number of number of bundles used per week uh, compared to the number of people in the house? Uh, no, but we could try that. Th that's a good idea. Um, and in terms of, it, I'm not sure. Um, so if you think about that as a metric, you mean? Think about bundles of firewood per per capita. Yeah. So I'm thinking, like for example, with the, it's just a picture and in different. Uh, Places they have like different types of wood, or they uh, they normally maybe bring like different sizes. But so when or when they ask how many bundles wait, did you collect in the last seven days, uh, which means they have to inter to interpret from what they collect, like translate what they collect right from that photo. Yeah, mm -hmm. from the photo. So I'm thinking like if you have like the consistency of like the number of uh, the number of uh, bundles used, if that is consistent with the number of, maybe the average number of household members. It's a good question. Uh, I can look at that. Sort of I check. can figure that out. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good check. Well, yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. It was a terrific talk, and uh, I think everybody got a lot out of it. And we look forward to what, how, how, you, how you go forward with this. Thank you. Thank you.